Next up, uh, so our next speaker is Dankrad Feist. Uh, Dankrad is an Ethereum researcher with a background in theoretical physics and technology. Since joining the Ethereum Foundation in 2019, he has worked on topics involving applied cryptography, sharding, statelessness, the proof of custody, and other related topics. His talk today is on data availability commitments with distributed reconstruction, thanks to 2D ZKG commitments, and how they were able to construct a unique data sharding solution that supports high data bandwidth while preserving security properties without requiring powerful actors beyond normal validators. Uh, Dankrat, I believe you're up. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Um, I'll try to share my slides here. Okay, we can see your screen. Go ahead. Okay, great. Cool. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about um, data availability commitments that allow distributed reconstruction and um, how we are able to do that uh, using a, a two-day, two-dimensional KZG scheme. Um, so uh, as an outline, um, I will be talking about um, uh, data availability sampling, how that works, the basic principle. Um, the Merkle tree based construction uh, that was uh, first suggested in 2018. Um, and then how we came across fraud proof reconstructions uh, using KCG commitments. And then uh, finally, how we improved them using a, a 2D scheme that also allows distributed reconstruction and gets rid of um, requirement uh, dependencies on um, super, super nodes. Uh, for everything except uh, for liveness. Well, potentially you could even remove it for that. So uh, let's talk about data availability sampling. Um, the idea of data availability sampling is that um, we want to know that um, uh, O of n data is um, available using only O of one work. So like um, this, well, what we basically want is we want to scale data availability. So we need to uh, somehow do less than O of n um, work in order to um, to ensure this. And um, the basic idea is, well, what if we distribute the data into uh, n chunks and each node um, selects uh, k randomly, um, uh, k selects uh, ran k random chunks and downloads these and uses that to check whether the data is available. Um, and so uh, the basic problem with, with that idea is that, um, well, what if, what if one of the chunks that you aren't checking for is missing, right? Uh, so in some applications that might not be such a big problem, you might be okay if 99.9% .9 of the data is available, but uh, in blockchains, because we have these applications where, for example, one single transaction could uh, print a billion ether, um, that's that's not sufficient. Like we really need to be sure that all the data is available. Um, otherwise, uh, we, we can't use it. And um, uh, so in order to be able to use this uh, technique, we need to uh, make it more powerful using something that's called erasure coding. Um, erasure coding means that uh, we take our original data and um, uh, we extend it. Um, uh, for example, using a polynomial. So what we can do is if we have these four data points on the left, uh, we can always put a polynomial of degree three uh, through them and evaluate it at a number of additional places. For example, four more places um, in order to double the original data. And then with the property that any polynomial of degree three can be, um, uh, is fully determined uh, by four evaluations. Uh, we know that if you know any four of these eight um, samples, you can get the full data. You get, you know everything about this polynomial and can thus compute all, the, all of the eight samples. And this is called the Reed-Solomon code. And in this example, uh, the, the coding rate is 0 0.5 because we extended it by a factor of two. Um, and uh, if we do this, then the uh, sampling that we described earlier uh, becomes efficient uh, because before we we had no way of using sampling um, to uh, um, we had no way of using sampling to efficiently make uh, uh, 
sure that all the data is available. Like, so we would have like in order to catch a single missing one with like a high probability, we would have to sample like, for example, if we wanted 99% probability, we would have to sample 99% of the data. So that's not efficient. Um, but uh, once we do this, it becomes different. So if, if, you, um, if you wanted to hide any data here, you would have to provide less than 50% of all the samples as an attacker. And in that case, if you, for example, do 30 random samples, uh, then the probability that all of these pass is only two to the minus 30. Um, so that's great. Um, the, the erasure coding can make uh, data will be sampling efficient, uh, but now we have another problem. Uh, now we need to ensure that this coding is correct. Um, because if, if the coding is incorrect, basically what could happen is that an attacker just uh, instead of providing um, uh, a, here in this example, eight uh, correctly encoded samples, they could just provide random samples. And then each four of these would not give you back the same polynomial, but each would uh, give a different polynomial. And um, then clearly, uh, yeah, like your, your sampling doesn't help because you still don't know what exactly the original data is unless you get the original data itself. Um, so there are um, mainly three uh, possible approaches to ensuring the correctness um, of an erasure code. Um, you can use fraud proofs. Um, you can prove that uh, uh, an encoding is correct. The um, sort of like, uh, well, naive way using a, a SNARK and then Variance C is uh, actually similar to B, it uses polynomial commitment, which is also a form of proving that it's correct, but it uses uh, more natively the cryptography and therefore um, becomes much more efficient as we're going to see. Um, so using fraud proofs, um, basically uh, let's assume that we commit to this data availability route, which is basically Merkle root of our, um, of our data samples. Uh, then uh, what, we, what, what would be required for a fraud proof, like let's say these are not all on the same low degree polynomial, uh, we need at least degree plus two pieces to construct a fraud proof, right? In order to prove that they are not all on this polynomial, we need enough pieces to reconstruct the polynomial, which is degree plus one, and then another one to, so that the node can see, oh no, like it's, it's, not, on, it's not all on one polynomial. And so the fraud proof would, in this case, in this naive way, be the same size as the data block. Um, so that, that's pretty terrible because now like the um, worst case actually stays the same as it originally was. You still have to send the whole data. So that's not practical for our application. We, we would only um, uh, get an average case reduction in the efficiency, uh, increase in the efficiency. But um, uh, so the, here's, here's an example um, of this. So you would need, for example, to give these five pieces in our example in order to prove that it's not um, on a low degree polynomial. Um, and the solution to that um, is to instead use two decodes. Um, so basically what you do is you uh, encode the data into a two dimensional polynomial. And um, uh, what this uh, what this means is that each row and each column um, in itself is a one-dimensional polynomial of low degree. Um, and uh, this is nice because that means if, any, if there's any incorrect encoding anywhere, then you can prove this by just giving either the row or the column where the, where the mistake happened. Um, and so the fraud proofs now uh, become root, uh, order of root n of the data size instead of order of n. And, uh, and this was basically the first um, practical, practically efficient um, data availability scheme. Um, and uh, it's also nice because it still only uses hash functions. So all this can be constructed using um, Merkle trees. And uh, this construction was uh, proposed by Alba Sam, Sonino, and Butuin in 2018. 
Um, the coding efficiency of 2D schemes um, is a bit lower. Um, and that is because uh, if we extend by a factor of two, so we keep the same coding write rate per row and column as we had before of 0 0.5, then the data actually be, uh, comes extended by a factor of four. Um, but we still require three quarters. Well, we actually, it's more. We now require three quarters of data to guarantee that all the data can be reconstructed. Um, so basically, if you imagine if I am uh, trying to hide data, then what I could do is I, could, I would hide a little bit more than one of these squares, like for example, the um, lower right square. If I just hide a little bit more than that, um, then uh, you wouldn't be able to reconstruct the data because each row and each column would be missing a little bit more than 50%. Um, so it would not be reconstructable. So we need three quarters to be sure that it's all available. And um, so if we compare that to the 1D scheme, then uh, that extends by a factor of two and requires one half for reconstruction. So it's, it's more efficient in the amount of data um, that you have to put on the network. Um, but uh, the main downside of, uh, of this ASB18 scheme is that um, it uh, actually requires fault proofs um, to verify the consensus correctness. So, um, so that means that we like we don't uh, since since we don't know that an encoding is correct by just looking at the root, um, it means that. Uh, we need we need to wait for fraud proofs before we are able to um, able to be be sure that a, a chain is correct, and um, and that's a bit impractical for consensus nodes, i.e. the stakers who construct the chain, because if they always had to wait for fraud proofs, while well, you could construct a chain like that, but you would be waiting waiting like at least several minutes or so each time, because like the it could take a little bit longer for fraud proof to arrive and you really, really want to be sure there isn't one. So it would be a very, very slow chain. Uh, that's not really what we want. So instead, um, anyone who uses this design is probably going to make a different decision, um, which is in practice, I think what Celestia is doing where uh, relying on this design is that um, you, you will use super nodes for the consensus nodes. So you require all those who actually participate in the consensus by constructing the chain uh, to be not just sampling the data, but downloading full data so that they are sure that there is no fraud. Because if you download all the samples, then you know that it's correct. Uh, this is not a practical solution for the Ethereum, Ethereum design because what we are really keen to have is um, that the consensus can remain distributed so that all that uh, yeah staking can run on like uh, say a Raspberry Pi at home um, that cannot process these amounts of data um, for example because it's also yeah just relying on a, a much smaller internet connection than would be required for this. Um, okay so uh, the, the next idea for um, what what you could do in order to um, get this uh, yeah sort out this fraud proof uh, problem is that uh, you could uh, take a a Merkle root of a, of an encoding and instead of using a fraud proof to ensure its correctness um, you construct a full um, snark that uh, that shows that this encoding is correct um, but doing this the naive way. Um, is very expensive and um, well one way to somewhat alleviate that is to use uh, modern smart snark friendly arithmetic hashes um, but we aren't really confident in them yet uh, they're not really that well proven so um, currently uh, we wouldn't really know what exact function with what parameters to use so that we could be confident that in uh, 10 20 years that is still a safe function um, if we instead just use uh, well-proven uh, hash functions, then it would be very expensive. Uh, in either way, like it's, it would be like sort of pretty big data center-like operation to compute these routes. And so um, we don't really consider this practical at the moment. Um, but uh, what is 
what has now become practical is a third option, um, which is using directly using polynomial commitment schemes on which these SNARKs are built. So like, for example, a commitment scheme like KCG10 um, allows us to directly commit to a polynomial, um, which is, in other words, the read solomon code. And the correctness is actually enforced by the commitment scheme. Uh, and that's um, orders of magnitude faster than using a general purpose snark on a Merkle root. Um, so uh, the KZG commitment scheme uh, takes a polynomial uh, defined here by f of x. And um, you can, based on that, you can compute a commitment to that polynomial. And for any uh, evaluation y equals f of z of that polynomial, you can compute uh, a prover um, using using the data of the um, polynomial itself, so the coefficients, can compute a proof pi um, that that proves that um, f of z equals y. So using this commitment c of f and the pi, uh, as well as the values y and z, a verifier can confirm that uh, indeed this uh, f of z equals y. And c of f and pi um, are just elliptic curves elements. Um, so for example, using BLS 12, 381, uh, which we are using, that's 48 bytes. So they are very nice and compact. And um, the way you use them as data availability routes is uh, you basically uh, take points on this polynomial. You now, now set like um, these uh, samples as f of zero, f of one, f of two, and so on. Um, and then you compute the KCG root of that polynomial. And um, yeah, you can basically think of this as something similar to a Merkle root, but um, it's all gu always guaranteed to be on the same polynomial. Um, in terms of efficiency, um, so uh, someone needs to compute all these samples and uh, and in particular, they need to compute their the KCG proofs because the sample is only valid if you have the corresponding KCG proof. Um, this is a lot more expensive than a Merkle proof, and naively, um, it would take um, O of n uh, work um, to compute one such proof. Like you always need to touch, uh, un unlike a Merkle proof where you only need to. Uh, um, touch uh, like log n elements. Um, if you naively compute a KCG proof, you need to touch all the, all the elements or all the coefficients of the polynomial. And so if you did that for all the proofs, it would be over n squared and um, that clearly wouldn't be practical. Um, but uh, luckily um, we came across a technique uh, that uh, Dimitri Kovratovich to, together with me um, developed in 2020, which allows um, Using using FFTs in the group, um, us to compute all these proofs in n log n time, and that makes it practical to to uh, use this as a data availability scheme and compute all the proofs. Um, now, if we if we use this um, in the way that we've described as a as a commitment scheme for one polynomial. Uh, then we need to consider one further thing, which is the reconstruction. So if less than all the samples are available, we always need to reconstruct the polynomial um, so that we can get all the samples if it's possible. Uh, and I mean, that's for two reasons. One is like we uh, need the original data. So applications or like the whoever is executing the chain or rollups. <laughs> They, they will of course need the, need the actual data. So if some data is in the original data are missing, we clearly need to reconstruct that in order to have the data. Um, but from a consensus point of view, more important is uh, the convergence property. So like we want uh, clearly that um, uh, all nodes should eventually agree whether a block is available or not, because this is one of our additional validity conditions now. And so, so we need that, uh, uh, that, all, all nodes will come to the same conclusion. So either less than our thresholds, like less than three quarters are available, um, in which case uh, we don't load enough samples so all, that all nodes will agree on that. But it could be that an attacker say makes a higher proportion of those available. And in that case, it would be, um, it would, would be there would be some nodes who think that it is available uh, and some nodes who will not see the data as available. 
Um, and this brings us to the problem with the 1D KCG scheme. So uh, this re the reconstruction, being able to reconstruct all the samples um, would still require super nodes. So it would require uh, nodes that are able to, uh, to download all the data and uh, compute, uh, co compute the, um, the individual proofs for all of them in order to distribute them. Uh, so that means that the reconstruction in the scheme requires um, super nodes. And that means that in the absence of honest super nodes, a malicious actor could split the chain. Um, so this is where we come to the two-dimensional KCG, KCG scheme. So in a way, this, uh, this looks similar to what we had earlier with the original um, scheme for uh, that that was uh, proposed in 2018 using Merkle roots, but instead um, now we com we we commit to um, KCG roots uh, for each row. And uh, those eight KCG commitments in this example themselves lie on a polynomial, so you can do a polynomial check on these. And this now has the property. Um, that the rows and columns can be individually reconstructed. So like a node that wants to help in reconstructing all samples can download one row or one column. And if more than 50% available, it can get all the samples in that row or column. And that way you can actually reconstruct the full square of data um, using only these nodes that process rows and columns. And so the, you can see the similarity to the um, to the Merkle root based 2D scheme, uh, where where we um, where our original motivation was to use the 2D scheme because we wanted to minimize the fraud proofs. And in this case, we're not worried about the fraud proofs anymore because the KCG scheme guarantees correctness. Um, but uh, but we can now reconstruct in a distributed way, which is another important property. Um, we can actually even use this to construct the, the block in a, in a distributed way. So we can also use this um, as a way to say there, there's actually nobody who needs to process all the data and compute um, all, the, um, all the proofs and all the extensions and all the KCG commitments for it, um, because you can also do that by rows and columns. Um, because the nice property is even, even the KCG commitments uh, can, can, can be extended. So you can just compute a polynomial extension on the data KCG commitments and get the extension KCG commitments um, below. And so that's also a really cool property. So we can also support distributed uh, block production, which uh, in my opinion is a little bit less, less um, important than distributed reconstruction, but it's still a nice property to have. Um, so the, pro the scheme was uh, proposed by Vitalik uh, Buterin in 2020. Um, and uh, so now basically what, what it achieves is that we require super nodes. Well, if we don't do distributed construction, last point, uh, it only requires super load nodes for liveness. If we do distributed construction, then actually we can also theoretically construct a scheme that does not require super nodes for anything. And um, at, at the very least, all the safety properties uh, can be ensured by nodes that can only process rows and columns. Uh, so yeah, as a conclusion, I've, uh, I've made an overview here to show um, what basically the uh, downsides and upsides um, of the different schemes are. Um, so on the left, we have the ASB18 um, Merkle fraud proof based uh, scheme. Um, and in the middle, I have uh, any scheme that's basically a proven Merkle root. So either a snark on a Merkle root or a 1D KCG scheme. Um, they have very similar properties. And on the right, I have the uh, um, relatively new 2D KCG scheme um, that, uh, that allows distributed reconstruction. Uh, yeah, and so like uh, the, the basically the big, the big additional thing that we get is that we can get a convergence property 
uh, for distributed reconstruction. Um, so the original uh, scheme clearly also had this property um, since it was also a 2D scheme. So that's not a complete new property, um, but, uh, but it's, unfortunately it requires super nodes in the consensus uh, because otherwise the, yeah, the, the consensus would be dependent on fault proofs, which would be problematic. Cool, so uh, that is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm open for any questions if there are any. Okay, thank you so much for your talk, Dankrat. Uh, if you have questions, uh, now is a good time to ask them. Again, you can uh, please ask them in text or raise your hands if you wanna speak. Keep in mind that if you do speak, you will be on the recording, so if you would uh, rather that I read your question, just note that in the text. So far, I see one question in Slack, uh, and I will read it out because Marco uh, is having some tech issues. And the question from Marco is, what is a super node? I might have missed it. And mm -hmm. could you explain the difference between white nodes and super nodes? Right. Um, so super nodes are, um, um, are any nodes, uh, that need to process all the data. So a super node would be an, a node that, that is able to process the full block data without doing sampling. So, um, I, in terminology, uh, you're right. I didn't, didn't, uh, define this, um, before. So a light node would be one that only does data availability sampling. Um, and in between, we would have nodes that uh, that download rows and columns, which is still much lower than a super node, but um, but a bit more than what a light node would do, which only does, does some random sampling of the data. Okay. Next, we have a question from Andre. Uh, Andre, would you like to read your question live? Uh, okay, uh, my question was, uh, how do you compute the public parameters for the PDG commitment? You, uh, you mean the trusted setup? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're currently in the process of arranging that. So, like, we, we are going to uh, um, have a trusted setup ceremony later this year. Um, so, that is in the works. Um, the good thing is that uh, uh, we only need a very small um, trusted setup of like, um, I think the, uh, the current design scheme only needs to the 12. We'll go a bit further in order to have some uh, room for future expansion, but maybe two to the 15 or something like that. And so it's gonna be a super small one and gonna be a super quick ceremony so we can have lots of participants. Uh, could you elaborate on why, um, why you need only a small, um... Uh, trust setup. Mm -hmm. So the the reason is that in the uh, in the two D KCG scheme, uh, you only uh, need commitments for for one row basically, and so the rows are relatively small. Um, so it's only like um, for example in the current design, uh, a bit more than four thousand field elements. Um, so that's a that's a very small trusted setup that you need in order to commit to that. Thank you. And I have one more question, if I may. Um, so the 2D KZG commitment, is it like a black box construction out of 1D KZG commitment or is it a separate? Uh, um, okay, so there are different ways. So you could, um, so basically the way we're proposing it um, is to simply um, give like the individual commitments like so you can you can simply this is in the second dimension we basically give a list of commitments and so it's not in the, in a way it's not a 2d kcg commitment it's a list of 1d kcg commitments you could also directly use 2d kcg commitments um uh which would have um yeah it would it would make some something slightly smaller but it um, it would provide much less flexibility in terms of how you can distribute transactions and so on so like this this um this small overhead seems worth it to us uh, so, so sorry it's probably a stupid question when you say small i mean isn't it square root of n mm -hmm. sure yeah okay so yes yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very open. Yeah. 
Okay, I have another question from Marco. Uh, do you expect this to go into production? And if so, do you have concrete plans for when? Uh, yeah, so I mean, that is the, it's the current plan for um, Ethereum sharding. Um, so a, uh, a first version that will use the, the same commitment scheme, but we won't, we won't actually do sampling yet based on this, like sort of a traditional, traditional scheme, I think will uh, go into production probably next year. So that's EAP 4844, which we're planning like as the next, uh, in, in the next hard fork after sharding. Uh, sorry, after the merge. Um, and then, yes, I mean, I, I, I would say within hopefully one or two years after that, that will go into production on Ethereum. And we seem to have another question from Alfonso. Alfonso? Yeah, really quick. Uh, with, I mean, we have a bunch of light nodes and these uh, data availability proofs. We would be able to recover the original data from these proofs. If I'm a light node and I just, I mean, the samples are out there, I would be able to recover the data as when, I mean, traditional Reed Solomon um, coding. Sorry, what is the question? So if I would be able to recover the original data from the proofs from the samples that are distributed. From the samples, yeah, yeah, yes. If you don't load enough samples, you can reconstruct the data, yeah. Okay, as long as I have enough samples, I would be able to reconstruct the original mm -hmm. data used for the project. That's right, that's right, yes. So like traditional read Solomon, we would have the same properties with these uh, mm -hmm. commitments. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's cool. right, yeah, yeah. I'm not seeing any other text questions. If there is a question that you would still like to ask. Maybe just you... a quick question. Yes, go ahead, Juliana. Yeah, uh, it's a very busy question. Uh, still early morning here. Uh, so <laughs> no <laughs> said, but uh, can you, could you go uh, again over the very basic motivation behind the, those features that, that you presented? Like, not how they're realized, why do we want them? Uh, which one? Which one in particular do you mean? Just really basic. Why would I want light nodes that can only verify data availability, but maybe not reconstruct the data or things like that? Right. I mean, well, that that's the, oh, why why you want the the want those light nodes. Um, I mean, that's the core paradigm of scaling, right? We we ultimately like um, if we want like we what what we want is we want blockchains that have the same properties as now like right now um like you cannot like miners cannot construct an ethereum chain that's not available that has missing blocks because full nodes would just not accept them right um and that that is one of the properties that we want to preserve as we scale the chain so we want to keep the same security properties as we have now uh, but be able to scale Ethereum. Um, and so what we need for that is to come up with constructions that scale. And uh, why, would, why would you want a light node? I guess is another po possible point of your question. Why would you be interested in a light node that can only tell you, yes, this is the head of the chain, but cannot tell you what uh, the data is. Like for example, would not be able to construct the actual state. Um, because you can get your state somewhere else. Like for example, now you say you have this light node that tells you here is the correct chip of the Ethereum chain. And, uh, and now you could go to like someone else and ask, hey, can you give me the balance of my account or like um, whether this transaction has passed through? Um, and they could give you a proof based on your latest state route, right? So they, they could they couldn't cheat on you. They could like they could give you like the data, and they could add like a, a witness that shows that this data is correct based on the latest um, uh, tip of the chain that your light node has uh, has provided you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that helps. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I think we still have time for one last question, if there are any. I have a small question about the motivation. So uh, you had a part of the talk where you talked about the availability proof, 
but um, I, I'm not sure I quite understand what's the purpose of having the availability proof when do you understand correctly that the node can refuse to serve re, when the data is actually needed, the node can refuse to, to give it. So it can have it, but it can refuse to help reconstruct it when it's needed. Right. So, I mean, I think the best way to, to see this is it's a, it's a gadget that prevents someone from withholding data. So yes, I agree. Like we do require actors. Like if, like, say I'm a light node, and I don't, um, uh, I don't actually download the data. I will need to get the data from someone when I actually want to, like, find out something about the chain. Right? Of course, that's true. Um, but my assumption is that Ethereum data is interesting enough that there will be will always be people around who 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 will provide that and do that for you. Maybe you have to pay them, but like it's possible. The what we need to make sure is that these actors, even if there's only one honest one left among them, that they will get guaranteed access to this data. Like that they are guaranteed to be able to download this data if they if they want to. And, and this is basically like, it's a little bit like, like a proof of data publishing, maybe also a good, uh, a good name for this. Like basically um, whoever is constructing the chain, um, even if like the majority of consensus nodes is malicious, they cannot force uh, others to accept this chain if they didn't, if they are trying to withhold the data. Does it make sense? I'm not sure how the sampling helps because, you know, there may be a node who has all the data and you sample it and you see that it has the data, mm -hmm. but right. then when you want to reconstruct it, it refuses. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, I, if, if only one person does the sample sampling, then it doesn't work. What you rely on is that there are lots of these light nodes that all do sampling. And now if the node tries to cheat, it can only, it could target you. If it knows who you are and knows your IP address, then it could give you all the samples, but nobody else does samples. And then it could trick you. But I mean, this still requires like uh, for an average person that would not happen because it requires that you overtake the whole consensus to make it vote for that, right? Um, so, um, So the, basically this mass of samplers, they, they protect you because like in aggregate, they would get enough of these samples so that the data could be reconstructed. So after they sample, do they store it locally yes. somehow? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, need, you need to keep the samples that you've done around and provide them uh, later if someone is trying to reconstruct as well, yeah. Okay, no, no, that's, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Perfect timing. Uh, we are exactly at time. Thank you so much, Dankrat, for your talk and for your comprehensive explanations.